men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful of us as Romans to adopt or observe. The magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be thrown. They and gave them a severe flogging. They threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, is that enough drama for you? Were you listening to that story? I mean, that is a big, wild story or set of stories in Acts chapter 16. This is one of those days, as I have done many times before, where I want to encourage you um, to open your Bible or your Bible app while we're uh, going through the scripture. But also, I want to encourage you um, this afternoon to open your Bible up and read all of chapter 16 of Acts. We didn't read the very beginning and the very ending, and there, there are these bookends um, on this chapter that d- just really bring it all to its completion. It is just a wonderful, rich, and kind of wild chapter in Acts. So our reading um, here in worship together started with Pythona. That's what I'm going to call her. And actually, Acts doesn't tell us her name, but we could call her Pythona, and I'll get to that in a sec. The girl could tell people's fortunes, which made her valuable to her owners. Owners. She was owned by other human beings. She was a slave. She was hired out to use this gift that she had to tell fortunes however it was, reading palms, looking into a crystal ball, entertaining people with her peculiar gift. But she was a possession This is an old problem, slavery, but it is a problem that has not gone away in today's world, though perhaps we don't think much about it. Humans are trafficked still, used to make money for those who wield power over them. This girl 
was enslaved, held in bondage, not only by her owners, but also by whatever it was that possessed her, this pneuma pythona. So if you were reading this in the Greek, the spirit of divination is in Greek pneuma pythona, a spirit that is able to divine things, but the root word there is snake or python. She has a snake spirit, a python spirit which connects her to the cult of the Greek god Apollo. Was it a demon? Was it an evil spirit? Would we look at it and say it's a mental illness, it's, it's schizophrenia? We're not to know exactly. But whatever had its grip on her compelled her to follow the Apostle Paul around the city of Philippi for multiple days while shouting out, announcing, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She was telling the truth. She got it right, but eventually she got on Paul's nerves. I mean, imagine that you're trying to go about your day-to-day -day business, do your job and whatnot, and there's somebody following you around the whole time yelling. It gets old no matter what they're yelling. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, but 8.30 folks got the better voice. <laughs> um, so um, she's, she's, she's been following Paul around, and finally she's gotten enough on his nerves that he decides to fix the problem. And so he fixes the problem by casting this spirit of divination out of her, getting it away from her. And so he uses the power of Jesus Christ to get rid of her fortune-telling ability. Now, you could look at this and say, she has been saved. She has been set free. She's been telling the truth about who Paul and his companions are, that in fact they are slaves themselves who belong to their Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus was with him, giving him the power to effectively rid her of that possession. And so this should be a story that has a happy ending, right? Girl set free from demon, slave no longer useful to her owners, owners let her walk free. That's the ending we might like to hear to the story, but it is not so. Because there's this economic problem in the scenario. Paul has ripped from her owners their good source of income. And they are not happy about it. And so they, they drag Paul and Silas before the powers that be, the authorities in their area, and they demand justice. You know, they're wanting a little payback for this, right? And so their complaint focuses on the mission, that, that these missionaries have been a public disturbance. Um, I'm thinking the girl going around yelling behind them was more of a public disturbance. But anyway, their complaint is that these guys have been a public disturbance and that they've been advocating customs that were not from around there. You know, they're doing things differently. They're bringing something that is not us. It's other. And the authorities agree with the accusation against Paul and Silas that they are some kind of subversives, some kind of a threat to the order of the state. A charge not unlike the accusations that are made against Jesus himself that led to his crucifixion. Well, Paul and Silas are severely beaten and thrown into jail. The ones who saved the girl and got her her freedom end up becoming captives themselves on account of what they have done. They are now held captive by the Roman authorities, and they are tucked way into the bowels of the prison, into the depths of the jail for safekeeping, locked in the stocks so that there is no chance of them going free. But Paul and Silas don't let their circumstance get them down. From the bowels of the prison, they sing and they pray in the depths of the night, shackled, yes, but their spirits are free because they know that God is with them. They worship in spite of their circumstances because they know who they belong to. They know that the Lord absolutely is with them. Religion has helped many a prisoner to make it through his or her incarceration. Religious fervor is not uncommon for those who are locked behind bars. Preaching on this passage led me to kind of 
get a little curious about the state of things in our prison system in the United States. And so, first of all, I just wanted to know how many people are in prison after all? We have 2.2 million Americans in our prisons right now. 2.2 million folks in prison. And the other detail that I came across when I was just nosing into this is a rather embarrassing detail, I think, embarrassing for me, and I would hope kind of an embarrassment for all of us. And that is that the United States of America has the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the world. Wow. So, I am so thankful for those in our United Methodist Connection and beyond who are committed to prison ministries, to reaching folks in prison with the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got folks connected um, in our local uh, area of United Methodism who do Kairos. Uh, that's kind of like Walk to Emmaus, a spiritual retreat for those in prison and for those who've just gotten out and their families. We also have folks who go in and do disciple Bible study week by week with prisoners. And this is in keeping with Jesus' own teaching, the clear importance that Jesus places on this in Matthew 25 when he says, when you, when you minister to those in prison, it is as though you are ministering unto me. So, if you have any inkling of interest in this or concern for this, talk to me because I can connect you with folks who are doing prison ministry and uh, find ways for you to be a part of that as well. So back to Paul and Silas. As they worship from their cell, the earth begins to shake, and the foundations of the prison are moved, and the gates open, and chains fall, and the jailer, it was the middle of the night, he had fallen asleep, but the violent earthquake shakes him awake, and seeing that the gates have opened, and knowing in his mind that surely the prisoners have been loosed, he has reason to believe that he is going to pay a terrible price for letting these prisoners get free. And so to avoid the consequences, the wrath that he might face, he prepares to take his own life. He lifts his sword, ready to end his life. And again, just as Paul did with the girl, Paul offers saving words to him, freeing words to the jailer. He says, do not harm yourself, we're all here. It's not as bad as you think. Hold on before you take an action that you cannot undo. Suicide is not the answer. Friends, this gives me pause to say to you, body of Christ, suicide is never the answer. If you or someone you love is talking about such things, thinking that's their only answer, let them know it's not. And you know this day it is not. And talk to someone you can trust immediately, me or another pastor, a friend, someone who can help you and get you to help. Well, thankfully, the jailer is stopped in time. There were other ways to deal with that situation. He just needed some help to see that there were other options. So someone gets a lantern, gets some light, and he sees that the prisoners are still there after all. What kind of prisoners are these? Paul and Silas, they are not like the others. And so the jailer asks them, what must I do to be saved? So here's the thing. We're in church. We're reading from the Bible. So we would read this and maybe we would guess that this has got to be a theological question, right? What must I do to be saved? But what if the jailer was just asking a practical question here? Maybe he was simply asking if they had some idea about how he could get out of this bad situation. Prisoners loose and able to leave. Jail in a shambles. If suicide was not the answer, then he's asking him, okay, so what is? What you got for me? Maybe the jailer just wanted to know, how will I get out of this mess? What must I do to be saved? Saved from what? Saved from what? It's a personal question in search of a personalized answer. What must I do to be saved from what destroys me? 
What must I do to be saved from my particular bondage, from my oppression, from my addiction, from my threat, from my emptiness, from my lostness? There are innumerable means by which we can lose our way in this world or get ourselves into some kind of trap in this life. There are many different threats from which a person may need to be saved. While the aftershocks may have still been rattling the walls of the prison, the jailer knows that he needs saving. And there is a precedent for what the authorities would do to a prison guard who let some Christian missionary get out of captivity. In Acts chapter 12, this happened. Peter escaped prison back in Acts chapter 12, and the guards are put to death for it. The threat to the jailer was clear. It was present. It was looming. We, on the other hand, are not always clear about our need for salvation, that we are in trouble, that our lives are not going the right way. We're pretty good at ignoring those thoughts, stuffing them down, placating ourselves that it's really all right, hiding those feelings or hiding from them, keeping on in our lostness as we distract ourselves with life's diversions. But the jailer's situation, there was no question. He was in immediate danger. He may have very well been asking not a theological question, but a very practical question. How can I save my neck right now? But they give him a highly theological answer. He gets this great big answer from Paul and Silas that fits the great big drama of this chapter. They declare that they won't just get him out of this present situation, but that they can bring salvation to his whole house. You know the old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes? That holds true here. The jailer, in his immediate fear of death, is ready for what Paul and Silas have to offer. He is ready for a God answer, even if he didn't mean to ask a theological question. And the answer is, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So the missionaries end up at the jailer's home where the gospel is proclaimed and the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ and all that he has done to save us in his life and his death and his resurrection is presented and the jailer and his family come to believe. And it's this beautiful back and forth here where first he washes their wounds. The jailer washes the wounds of Paul and Silas, takes the role of servant and helper to them, and then they turn around and they wash him and his family with the waters of baptism. How beautiful. What a night. They share a meal together and rejoice in what God has done for them. What a story. Whatever the jailer may have meant by his question when it came out of his mouth, what must I do to be saved, the answer that he got draws him into this much bigger story, bigger than the drama of Act 16. The answer that he got draws him into the story that we are a part of, too. The one in which God is seeking to set everybody free. Everybody free. Where Jesus is about the business of seeking to redeem all who are in any kind of chains. The Greek word here for save is sozo. Like most words in any language, of course, this word has layers of meaning and different applications and different usages depending on the situation. Usage from the, the quotidian, the mundane, the everyday, the ordinary, to the theological and Christological. It can mean to keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction, to save someone who is suffering from perishing. It can mean to make well, to bring Wholeness, health, healing. And it can mean to deliver from the penalties of the final judgment. Our experiences of salvation may vary. 
Our chains don't all look the same. For the slave girl with the python spirit, it looked like getting rid of that spirit that possessed her so that she would no longer be enslaved on account of it. For the jailer, it looked like not killing himself, ending his own life for failing at his job. And it looked like he and his family getting baptized. We don't all experience salvation in the same way. And yet Paul's answer is the answer for everybody. What we need, what you need, what the whole world needs is to trust in, to believe on Jesus. Like the girl and the jailer, we cannot save ourselves. Our stories are unique. The circumstances from which each one of us needs to be saved are individual. They're ours. But one answer does fit all. It's not a self-improvement program or six steps you need to take or some strategic plan. It is the discovery that our small individual lives, our personal stories are swept up in this great grand drama that God is reaching out to each of us in Jesus Christ, that we are not alone in our traps, our cells, our sickness, our fears, our loneliness, our addictions, our brokenness, that Jesus has his hand open to reach out to each of us to try to lift us up from the muck that we get ourselves into and pull us into his salvation story, into the gospel that transforms and redeems and gives new life. Trusting in him means giving up trying to save ourselves because no matter what your problem is, ultimately the answer to the question is the same. Jesus saves. Thanks be to God. Amen.